Yes. The point of saying yes and is that it moves action forward, whereas saying no just stops action from moving forward. That's why saying yes and is a fundamental tenet of performance. Yes, action is important. And in order to take action, you have to know what it is you're in pursuit of. You have to know what it is you want. Absolutely. So I love the stage. I love being on the stage. I think, though, that Shakespeare had it right when he said, all the world's a stage. That is why more people need to see themselves as performers. Well, the challenge is that most people have to perform, even if they don't see themselves as performers. Oh. I don't know if they're going to buy it. Who, the audience? Yes. No, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure they'll be quick to agree that in our personal and professional lives, we're called upon to make toasts or give eulogies. Or nail a job interview or yes. win a negotiation. Yes, and they're all high-stakes situations. They'll agree with that, and I'm sure they'll agree that if you cannot deliver during life's high-stakes moments, good luck making your dreams come true. But I'm not sure they'll buy the concept that just as actors use techniques on the stage to create a believable reality, non-actors can use the same techniques off the stage to create a reality of their choosing. Wait, you just said that really well. Say it again. Well, uh, actors yeah. use techniques on the stage to create a believable reality, non-actors can use the same techniques off the stage. To create a reality of their choosing. Yes. Why don't you think they'll buy that? Because I think a lot of people think performance is phony or fake. You know, I think that's one of the differences between people who see themselves as performers and people who don't. Because performers know that performance isn't fake behavior. Performance is authentic behavior in a manufactured environment. That's good. Say that again. So performance isn't fake behavior. Great performance requires authentic behavior in a manufactured environment. Now that's what we have to get them to see and do something with because life is full of manufactured environments. Like this. This is a very manufactured environment. Yeah, 2,500 people sitting in a theater whose role is to sit and pay attention and not interrupt the speakers and not talk to their neighbors. Uh, and the speakers are supposed to stand on a red dot and say something. In no more than 18 minutes. That is going to change the lives of every person in this room and potentially millions watching online. High stakes. Nice. <laughs> OK. So let's back this up. The concept that all the world's a stage and that knowing how to perform in life's high stakes moments when the spotlight is on us matters, that we think they'll buy. Yes. This idea that non-actors can take the techniques that an actor uses and use them in day-to-day -day life to create reality, let's go back to that. Because that'll be a new idea for many of them and it's not a typical way of seeing the world. Yeah, I think many people are terrified of being in the spotlight. Yes. And if I have to hear the old studies show that people are more afraid of public speaking than death thing, I'm going to lose my mind. I mean, that's a myth. The idea that people are more afraid of public speaking than death is ridiculous. She's right. You know, there has never been a study that shows, proves people are more afraid of public speaking than dying. The study that is often referenced was done in 1973 by a guy named Bruskin. And his team never asked people to rank their fears or even select their top fear. What they discovered was that public speaking is people's most common fear, but it is not their biggest fear. If I put a gun to his head and said, hey, Michael, you have two choices. Choice number one, you speak. <laughs> choice number two, you die. I mean, really, how many people are going to say, yeah, please, just pull the trigger. Just kill me right now. You, you would rather speak than get shot in the head. Yeah, you would. So 
if they're willing to accept a little bit of fear as part of the normal experience of doing things that we care about, and they're willing to change the way they see performance as something that they can be good at and use in everyday life, then we just need an example of how to use this in day-to-day -day life and not just on a stage. Oh, like when you met my parents. I was legitimately nervous. Were you really? Yes. Well, whatever you did, it worked. So let's use that as an example. Walk me through how you prepared to meet them for the first time. Okay. Well, um, I, just, I just asked myself the same questions that an actor would initially ask when developing a character. So what questions did you ask? Well, first I asked, what's my super objective? You know, what's my big picture end goal? And you chose? To have a harmonious, integrated family. I mean, it was just the first time we were meeting, but I still thought seriously about what I wanted for all of us in the long term. You see, most people would have had a short-term objective, like getting approval, getting my parents to like them. You, however, had a fully thought out end goal in mind, and then you played actions, which is what actors do. Well, I played the action to make them feel safe. Exactly. So you consciously chose what you wanted them to feel, and that helped you achieve your objective of having a harmoniously integrated family. It's so true. You know, since playing actions is what one does or says to achieve an objective, it gives you the ability to change the action you play when the one you're playing doesn't work, because not everything you say or do is going to work, and people don't always respond exactly the way you want them to. <laughs> but if you can fluidly play one action after another in pursuit of your objective, it gives you this ability to improvise in the moment and be flexible. So if, for example, I was playing the action to make your parents feel safe and it wasn't working, I could switch and I could play to make them feel included. Or make them feel valued, or make them feel reassured. Wait. If we share this example, I'm a little bit concerned that the audience might think I was trying to manipulate your parents. But you weren't. You were trying to influence them. You were trying to affect them. But isn't that what we do all day long? All day long, we try to affect people, and we do affect people. All day long, we make people feel things. The difference is that if we're trying to get what we want, and we don't consciously choose our objectives, then we're still making people feel things. We're just doing it unconsciously or even thoughtlessly. And we might even hurt their feelings in the process. Yes, and then we're a lot less likely to get what we want. However, if we choose our actions more consciously, more, more responsibly, then not only are we more likely to get what we want, but we may actually treat people better in the process. That's what happens when you're prepared. So it seems we have two choices. Either A, get really clear on what we want and how we want other people to feel in the process, yes. and then go get it, <laughs> or B, wing our way through life and take whatever we can get. Yes, and if we're really clear about what we want, then we can be performers who adapt our behavior to fit the manufactured environments we're in. There's the rub. The concept of adapting our behavior moment by moment to fit into various manufactured environments, that, that worldview makes people uncomfortable. Why? Well, because the idea of performing, of changing the way we behave or the way we act, that's confronting to a lot of people. But why? Well, maybe, maybe many folks feel that they are who they are and that's it. That they only have one authentic way of being. 
and that people who fluidly adapt their behavior to fit into different groups or play different roles in different situations are somehow inauthentic. Now, even if they are open to seeing the world this way, they may still be scared of coming across as inauthentic. Okay, so let, let's go back to fear and see if we can address this in a way that makes people feel more comfortable. I don't want to talk about fear. I'm sick of talking about fear. It just perpetuates more fear. Plus, being comfortable with discomfort is a principal characteristic of being a performer. Well, we have to address it because being comfortable with discomfort is not very comfortable for most people. Who's on first? <laughs> Listen, we have to address this in two ways. Sit down. Yes, ma'am. Okay. One is that fear is completely human. It's normal. Fair enough. And two, what is it we are so afraid of anyway? Rejection? That's right, fear of rejection. Oh, it's the killer of any great performance. Rejection. No, that's what we're afraid of. The killer of any great performance is, okay, do not take me literally, just look for the metaphor because I'm completely making this up. Now, I imagine that back at the beginning of TED, a crew member, he sees that the speakers are sort of wandering aimlessly around the stage, you know, <laughs> pacing back and forth as speakers are wont to do. And so he needs a way to keep them stationary to capture video. So he goes backstage, he gets a carpet and a pair of scissors. <laughs> <laughs> and he cuts out a big circle and he throws it on the stage and says, hey, yo, stay on that dot. Don't get off that dot ever. <laughs> and then it worked. And from that moment forward, that red dot became a relatively safe place to be. Now, don't get me wrong, great speeches are delivered from the red dot, but generally speaking, what is the killer of any great performance? Playing it safe. Yes. See, we understand the fear people have of public speaking, but why is it that we so often play it safe in other aspects of our lives? It's the same fear as public speaking, fear of rejection, after all, the fear of being criticized or being laughed at or of making a really bad choice, well, they're all real and often they boil down to the fear of rejection and the need for approval. But to be moment makers, to be high level performers both on and off the stage, we need to take great risks and not worry that we'll be criticized for doing so. Because when we are not worried about what other people think, then we are that much more free to deliver the life-changing, reality-creating performances. And then, so what if we're criticized? You know, someone in here is not gonna like that we take down and put up the fourth wall. <laughs> hey, tell them the Aesop's fable. The one about the donkey. Oh, okay. There's an old man and a little boy and a donkey, and they want to go to town. So the old man gets on the donkey, and the little boy walks next to the donkey. But they passed some people who shamed the old man, saying, old man, how can you make a little boy walk like that? That's terrible. <laughs> so they switched. The little boy got on the donkey, and the old man walked next to the donkey. Now they passed some people who scolded the little boy and said, little boy, how can you make an old man walk like that? That's terrible. So they decided to both walk. But now they passed some people who laughed at them and said, look at those idiots. They have a perfectly good donkey and they are walking next to it. What is wrong with them? So they decided they'd both ride the donkey. But now they passed some people who ridiculed them and said, how dare you put such a load on a donkey? That is inhumane. So they decided to carry the donkey. <laughs> now, they're about to get to town, and in order to get to town, they have to, have to cross a bridge which is over water. And as they're crossing this bridge, the donkey slips out of their hands, falls into the river, and drowns. And the moral of the story, if you try to please everyone, you might as well kiss your ass goodbye. <laughs> You see, when you see yourself as a performer, you don't care what other people think. 
But more importantly, and what inspires me most, is how much people change personally when they do see themselves as performers and make big choices in pursuit of their dreams. Joel cut off his mullet. Now, that may seem like a small thing, but that was actually transformational. Yeah. Uh, Treb told me that a barista wrote his name correctly on a coffee cup for the first time in his life because he was able to say his name with confidence and command. Until then, they thought his name was Pleb. He'd been Pleb for four years. It was not ideal. You know, these seemingly small transformations add up. When you see yourself as an everyday performer, you are the one who creates your reality. And that is why we're talking about this now. Not just so you can give better speeches. When you are a great everyday performer, you're focused on what you want to create rather than on what people think. Let's tell him about um, Lori, the, uh, the accountant. accountant. Yes. So Lori did not possess, does not possess, a big charismatic performer's personality. She just wanted to, in her own words, find her voice. And when we asked her to present to a group of strangers, she, she couldn't project her voice more than what, a few feet? And she had her whole speech written on note cards, and she was gripping onto them like her life depended on it. So naturally, I took the cards away. And the words that she used to describe how she felt about me at that moment, I probably shouldn't repeat here. But without her cards to hide behind, she finally told the truth. So she shared that she'd been hiding for most of her life. She told us that she was petrified, not just of speaking in public, but of even sharing her ideas. As a little girl, the one time she spoke up about something she really believed in, her mother slapped her across the face and said, no one wants to hear from you. And that one moment shut her up for almost 40 years. When you think that you have to protect yourself from getting hurt. It seems like all you've really done is silenced your voice and maybe even repressed your dreams. You've wasted your actions on self-protection rather than on playing actions that are going to get you what you want. So consider this, to be more open when you're performing is actually where your true strength lies. As it turns out, people do want to hear from Lori. And we believe they want to hear from you too, that you have something important to say. The question is, do you believe it? Are you willing to see yourself as a performer? And if you are, are you willing to develop the performance skills necessary to deliver during life's high stakes moments? We sure hope you are because <laughs> It's pretty easy to see that the reason some people seem captivating, while others might be easier to forget, lies in the creative history and unique craft of acting. It might also be worth considering that the reason some people have the lives they want, while others accept the lives they're given, may also lie in the creative history and unique craft of acting. We believe it, it does. does. And we hope that you do too. Thank you very much.